Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty. This week, I have a tidbit about the alphabet song, and in honor of the upcoming TV extravaganza Shark Week, I have a meaty middle about shark idioms. As we were making the bonus episode about Schoolhouse Rock for Stitcher Premium subscribers a few weeks ago, I started thinking about how effective music is for helping you remember things. For example, some boys in my high school chemistry class made up a song about Avogadro's number. Just now, I had to look up what the number actually is and why we needed to know it for chemistry. It's the number of units in one mole of any substance. Thanks, Google. But because of that song, I can still tell you off the top of my head that 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd is Avogadro's number. Thanks, music. So, with all that on my mind, I couldn't resist this tidbit by Rachel Dwyer about the origin of the alphabet song. Hendrix, age six, from Dunsborough, Western Australia, asked, Who made the ABC song? A common answer to this question is that the ABC song was first copyrighted under the title The Schoolmaster in 1834 by an American man named Charles Bradley. You can see the original sheet music and lyrics on the Library of Congress website, and I'll post a link to it on the transcript of this podcast at quickanddirtytips.com. But the history of this famous song goes back a little further than that. Nobody knows exactly who invented this tune, but we have some clues about how it developed and became popular over time. The ABC song uses the same tune as Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and it's similar to Ba Ba Black Sheep. Try humming each one to check for yourself. It kind of blew my mind. The oldest published version of the tune is from 1761, but we don't know who wrote it, and it didn't have any words. The Twinkle Twinkle Little Star words were written by an English poet called Jane Taylor in 1806. The tune has also been used by lots of different composers as a basis for their pieces. Even a very famous classical music composer called Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Mozart wrote A vous dérange maman, which means Ah mother if I could tell you, in English, in 1785. It sounds a lot like the ABC song. When the ABC song first became popular, not many children went to school. That meant that most people never learned to read or write. Over time, as it became more important to learn to read and write, more and more children learned the song when they were young to help them remember the letters of the alphabet. Another question that might be worth thinking about is why we sing the alphabet song at all. It has to do with how we learn. Children have always learned things from their parents and grandparents. Because most people didn't read or write, they weren't written down, so it was really important to remember them. Groups of people in different places had their own songs to tell stories and pass down their history from one generation to the next. Because of the way our brains work, we can remember songs and rhymes much more easily. The reasons are a bit complicated, but it's partly because we pay more attention to the timing and speed of the sounds. When we do this, we use more of our brain at the same time, which means we remember it better. So we don't really know exactly who wrote the ABC song, but we know that most children who learn to read and write English now sing this song to help them remember the letters. That segment was written by Rachel Dwyer, who's a lecturer in music education and teaching at the University of the Sunshine Coast. It originally appeared on The Conversation and is included here through a Creative Commons license. Before we get to sharks, today's sponsor is Babbel, the top-selling language learning app in the world. The hardest part about learning a language for me, and this might not surprise you, is getting the pronunciations right, because I usually try to learn by reading— But now, learning is easier than ever thanks to Babbel, which has the written parts I like, but also an audio part. With Babbel's 10 to 15 minute lessons, you can be speaking confidently in Spanish, French, Italian, German, Russian, Swedish, or another language within weeks. Learn through interactive dialogues, speech recognition, and fun trainers and quizzes, either online or in the Babbel app. 
Users of Babbel have said they've been amazed at how fast they learned and are speaking so confidently using Babbel. One Babbel user says, quote, I always thought I was bad at languages, but after Babbel, I can see I was just taught the wrong way, unquote. Get 50% off your first three months with the code GG when you go to Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash G-G. That's Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash G-G and the offer code GG for 50% off your first three months. And now, on to sharks, or tiburones, as they're called in Spanish. Some of you might know that this is Shark Week, brainchild of the very clever marketing folks at the Discovery Channel. This is Discovery's 30th year of hosting Shark Week, and in honor of that milestone, we decided to talk about some funky phrases about sharks. And bonus, all of these have their origin in television or movies. Let's start with a classic, jumping the shark. This phrase was first used to describe the moment a TV show has clearly run out of ideas and resorted to cheap stunts to get viewers. You might assume the phrase is metaphorical, but it refers to an actual episode of the sitcom Happy Days, which ran from 1974 to 1984. In one infamous episode, the entire cast takes a trip to California. In a drawn-out beach scene, the character Fonzie is water skiing, wearing a leather jacket, of course, and jumps over a shark. The expression has become ubiquitous over the years. Its meaning has broadened to refer to just about anything, from a politician to a restaurant franchise, that has reached its peak and fails miserably in its efforts to remain relevant. For example, a recent article discussed how the breakfast chain IHOP, International House of Pancakes, changed its name to IHOB, then revealed that it was just a stunt to promote its burgers. Get it? Because burgers start with B. The author of the article asked, have branded PR stunts jumped the shark? In other words, are they resorting to gimmicks in a desperate attempt to sell product? I don't know the answer to that, but it sounds likely. Voodoo shark is a lesser-known term that also has its roots in pop culture. It refers to a failed attempt to fill a plot hole in the narrative. Its origins lie in Jaws, The Revenge, a movie so bad it killed the popular Jaws franchise and earned a 0% rating on the movie review website Rotten Tomatoes. In the film, a shark is somehow able to locate and seek revenge on the family of its nemesis, Sheriff Martin Brody. No explanation is offered as to how exactly the shark acquired these superpowers. A follow-up novelization of the movie tried to fill this gaping plot hole. It explained that the shark was under a voodoo curse. However, the author never bothered to mention by whom, how, or even why this curse was made. Henceforth, the term voodoo shark has referred to a weak explanation that creates more questions than it answers. A good example is the Metachlorians in the Star Wars franchise. These tiny organisms were introduced into the world in The Phantom Menace, the often reviled fourth movie in the series. The movie tried to explain how the Force works by pointing to midichlorians, tiny organisms that supposedly live in the cells of all life forms. Apparently, they are what enabled Jedi warriors to channel the Force. But this explanation introduced more questions than it answered. How exactly do midichlorians interact with the Force? Why do some people have more than others? And are there special midichlorians that connect to the dark side? And so forth and so on. Midichlorians are a voodoo shark. While we're on the subject of silly explanations, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the Sharknado series. It's currently on its fifth iteration— Sharknado Global Swarming. A Sharknado is exactly what it sounds like. A natural disaster in which a tornado scoops up sharks from the ocean and sprinkles them all over unsuspecting citizens. At once scorned and beloved, the Sharknado franchise enjoys a special status in U.S. popular culture. It's similar to that briefly held by the movie Snakes on a Plane. That one has zero sequels, by the way. 
Many of you have probably seen the 1997 movie Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery. The movie spawned countless popular quotations, and one of the most famous involves our friend, the shark. In the film, supervillain Dr. Evil has an intricate plan to destroy the hero, Austin Powers. When Dr. Evil's plan fails, he rants, You know, I have one simple request, and that is to have sharks with frickin' laser beams attached to their heads. This moment inspired countless memes, and it's an expression that's still used in response to an absurd, if not impossible, request. For example, a professor at William & Mary University was quoted as describing all the blue sky projects his team was working on using 3D printing technology. He ended the article with this thought. Sharks with laser beams attached to their heads? Sure, we'll give it our best shot. Some of our older listeners, and that includes me, might remember the land shark. He was featured on early episodes of Saturday Night Live and played by actor Chevy Chase. This silly predator would knock on the door of unsuspecting women and announce plumber or flowers. As Jaws-inspired music soared, the victim would open the door, only to be devoured by a giant stuffed shark. As the body count piled up, the land shark would use increasingly absurd ruses to get his victims to fall for his scheme. If you've ever heard someone inexplicably shout, Candy Graham, well, now you know why. Finally, there's a popular reality show called Shark Tank. This show pits real-life entrepreneurs against each other in front of a panel of potential investors. The investors are referred to as sharks because they're ruthless in their criticism and intimidating to face. The sharks offer feedback and decide which startups, if any, get money. The title Shark Tank is likely a nod to the intense and cutthroat nature of venture capitalism, as well as the risks hungry entrepreneurs face in the real world. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as Dragonfly Edit. Finally, hello to Dylan from Texas, who says he's totally Texas about the podcast, and Christian, who listens on the bus to and from work in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and often shares my articles with coworkers to explain editorial mandates. Thanks for spreading the word, Christian. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. Did you know that I've written seven books about language? You could try my New York Times bestseller, Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing, or my quite complete Ultimate Writing Guide for Students, or the short and to the point 101 misused words you'll never confuse again. You can find them where all fine books are sold. That's all. Thanks for listening. <laughs>